Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Susan uh, by Beja. Beja. I knew I was going to mess it up. Um, Susan has a PhD in clinical child development from the University of Washington, and she has trained at uh, UCLA, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and completed her postdoc at the University of Washington as well, working um, in some of the premier labs in the country with uh, Jerry Dawson and Helen Tagger Flussberg, among others. And now she has joined us in Boston, as any smart autism researcher would in this great community. And she has her own lab at Children's Hospital Boston in the center there. And uh, her work on the behavioral and basis of face processing um, in autism is, I think, some of the most exciting and the most elegant work being done in this area using um, really nice clinical behavioral measures, um, interventions, and uh, ERP and fMRI. And I think the thing that makes her work really nice is that not only does she do a nice job matching subjects on all the important clinical measures, doing really careful um, experimental design, but that also that her work has a real applied and clinical um, aspect to it in that not only are we understanding the brain basis and the behavioral basis of face processing and other social processes in typical development and in autism, but that th th this work might really be able to help individuals in the future. Um, and I think she'll continue to pursue these questions as she's joining us in Boston. And um, tonight she's going to tell us about, along that line, developing targeted interventions for autism spectrum disorders. So please help me welcome Dr. Susan Faja. Thank you so much. That was such a nice introduction. Um, as I was looking over the list of speakers that have come to talk to you, I have to say I'm extremely humbled and I'm also really excited to be able to come and share some of the work that my lab has been doing and will be doing. Um, and I am in Boston, so if I didn't have a chance to meet with you today, uh, I would love to, to meet with everyone and, and hear more about the work that you're doing already. It's such an exciting place to be an autism researcher. And um, I'm also really excited about all the amazing opportunities for collaboration here in Boston. So my work actually began uh, when I was in high school and I met the first individual um, with autism um, that was identified to me and worked with that individual as a camper at a camp for special needs um, children. And during my time at the camp, I was really struck by the differences in behavior that I saw in all of the campers, and especially in the children with autism, and really uh, very curious about the kinds of um, differences in brain structure and function that might underlie those differences in behavior. And so that question really drove uh, all of my training and has driven a lot of my research questions since then. And at the same time, as I was working with children at camp, I was interested in understanding the mechanisms of intervention. I felt like the kinds of intervention um, that were out there um, at the time were not particularly well understood in terms of how they were working for, um, for individuals with autism. And so um, in my work tonight, I'll hopefully share with you some of the um, directions that I've taken to address both of those questions. So I think um, we're well aware of the prevalence of autism. Um, autism is uh, increasing in the US population. Um, in this picture, um, we could expect to have one child in the classroom here um, have a diagnosis of autism. And uh, the cost of autism is extremely high. Um, it's really a sobering statistic to, to see how many individuals have autism and how much it's costing both at the societal level and to individual families. And so I think we really do need to be thinking very seriously about um, what kinds of interventions are available and how we can improve them. So currently, uh, I think of intervention as falling into two categories, um, behavioral interventions for autism. So um, on one hand, we have comprehensive interventions that target all of the different kinds of symptoms that are associated with autism. And um, these uh, tend to be very intense in their uh, delivery. Um, uh, the published studies for a comprehensive intervention would typically be 20 to 25 hours a week of intervention over the course of a year or two. 
Um, some examples of early uh, interventions that are comprehensive would be the Early Start Denver model intervention for toddlers and um, different methods of applied behavior analysis. On the other hand, there are interventions that are more targeted. So these would be focused on a specific domain of functioning or even a subdomain of functioning. Um, they often are more brief uh, in terms of implementation and intensity. Uh, so maybe just a few hours for some of the interventions. And an example would be Connie Cassery's work um, training um, joint attention. So uh, for my thinking about intervention and the work that I'm doing, I'm interested in more targeted interventions. And I'm thinking about how those subdomains might be contributing to the kinds of symptoms that we see uh, across the entire spectrum of behaviors. So um, social communication difficulties and repetitive behaviors and how the um, different subdomains might underlie those broad uh, symptoms that we see. So tonight I'll be talking to you about two domains that we've worked on. Um, one is the ability to recognize faces. So when we think about our ability to recognize and represent other people, it's a pretty complex task. We need to be able to identify a face. We need to be able to link that face to an individual. And there's a lot of meaning behind that individual. We know things about the individual. Um, we're also doing that face recognition um, when um, in the context of a really complex social interaction in most cases. So um, the individual is not just looking at us, but usually talking to us, um, expressing a variety of different emotions, and we need to take all of that information in simultaneously to represent other people. Um, another domain that we'll be talking about um, in the second half of my talk is the ability to interact flexibly. And I think that executive function, the cognitive domain of executive function, would underlie this ability. So in social situations, um, such as the one shown here, we may need to be able to compromise. Each child may have his own goal about what kind of thing he'd like to build with snow. And um, the two of them need to work together to come up with a common goal in order to have the social interaction be effective. But that ability to inhibit your own desire, to shift back and forth between your goal and your peer's goal, um, these are things that I think executive function may be contributing to. <clears throat> One advantage of studying more targeted interventions is that there are potential uh, neural roadmaps for how we can then measure the, um, the effects of those interventions. So this is a model that was put forth by Dawson and her colleagues. And um, this was a, a big model in my graduate school lab. And so we were thinking about how different domains of functioning might be fitting together in autism. But these are domains that have been implicated in autism um, across a, a number of studies. Uh, tonight, I'll be talking to you about the face processing system and the executive function system with a little bit of a discussion of the reward system and how that might interact with face processing and executive function. So let's start by talking about face recognition training. <clears throat> so here we have a picture of children at an amusement park. Um, if we knew a child in this picture, we would be able to pick him or her out very quickly. So if we had a, a child or a friend in this picture, um, we'd be able to recognize that face, even though uh, the face might not be pointed directly at us. Um, there may be different emotional expressions on the face. So um, the child may be fearful or excited and happy. And we'd be able to recognize that child that we knew across all of those different conditions. Um, so I like to just sort of step back and think about how complex face processing is. And even just looking at a subdomain, thinking about how daunting the task of developing a training for face recognition might be. These are all things that are difficult um, on average for individuals with autism. So um, just yesterday, I did a quick PubMed, PubMed search and um, looked at faces and autism and came up with 850 results. So it's been well studied. Um, there are a number of different deficits that have been documented. So we see different patterns of attention to faces on average. Um, there's really nice, elegant eye tracking work that can show that. Uh, we see difficulties with remembering and recognizing faces, uh, as I mentioned, understanding emotional expressions. And we, do, we see differences in the brain systems that are thought to underlie uh, face recognition. So differences in fusiform activation um, and atypical electrophysiological responses um, in event-related potentials, or ERPs. Um, we do, um, however, see that familiarity and attention to faces can modulate some of these effects. And so in reviewing the literature, 
Um, this was something that was really interesting to the group that I was working with, and we were curious whether there would be a way to manipulate this. So that was really how the face training began. And what we wanted to do is try to um, manipulate attention and um, familiarity with faces through some sort of training. And we, we just sort of stepped back and thought about everything that we knew about autism at the time and face processing and what we thought might be going wrong. And um, we also wanted to just look generally about what we knew about how face recognition develops um, in general in the population. And so I think um, uh, we took the cognitive neuroscience literature as a starting point, and I know this is um, familiar territory for many people here at MIT, um, looking at um, the specialization of face processing and um, some of the unique processing advantages that we see for faces. And uh, there is a group of uh, researchers who um, set out to just sort of test whether um, faces were special or whether those same kinds of advantages, um, expert-like processing, could be conveyed through training. Um, and development of expertise with other perceptual categories besides faces. Um, so this expertise literature um, gave us an idea of a, a framework for how we could structure training. So we did actually think that uh, faces were special and we wanted to um, do training with faces, um, but we thought we could turn that expertise training on its head and use some of the same strategies to enhance the processing that we saw um, in faces in individuals with autism. So um, what we did is we set up a set of matching activities. Uh, each in, um, each um, participant who received training learned to match different levels of meaning um, to a face. So um, this spanned from the basic level of um, classification, which would be gender in the case of our faces, to an individual label that uniquely identified each face. And in the case of our training, we chose to use an individual design that corresponded with each face rather than a name just to simplify the verbal demands. Um, I think a name would be just fine as well. Uh, in addition, we thought there's probably more to the story. Um, there's probably a reason why these sorts of things aren't happening automatically in individuals with autism. And so um, we also thought about attention to faces and whether there might be an input problem. Um, whether the information that was going into the system may be um, insufficient in some way or that the attention, the differences in attention might be contributing to the kinds of um, perceptual input that, that our trainees were, were having in their daily lives. So what we did is we manipulated the faces by also um, reducing the information down to the core essence of the face. So we um, had the matching activities um, occur not only with the top type of face, but also with faces that were cropped and with faces that were filtered or blurred so that uh, high spatial frequency information was removed and the trainees had to rely on more configural information in the face. And then finally, thinking back to that picture of children at the amusement park, we wanted to make sure that the people who received training could recognize a face across different conditions rather than just memorizing a single photo. So we also had a multi-angle condition. Above and beyond that, we thought that um, there was some interesting work coming out of um, Bob Schultz's lab. Um, Schultz and Gerlotti published a study around the time that we were starting our training uh, looking at whether the fusiform could be activated in response to um, a, a, a perceptual category that was of intense interest to an individual with autism, um, Digimon, and um, they showed that there was indeed fusiform activation in response to this category of intense interest. And so we thought maybe there's something about the reward value of the category that's also driving this system. Maybe faces aren't as rewarding as some other things that people could be looking at. So um, this also resonated with the cognitive neuroscience literature that looked at expertise. So um, you can train expertise in the lab, you can get people to be expert on things like greebles, but in the real world when someone becomes an expert with something beyond faces, um, typically it's because of their love and passion for that category. So if you learn to recognize individual species of birds, um, it may be because you really love birds. And so we really wanted to put this reward aspect into our training. So when participants made a correct match, they were able to select a feedback image of their choosing and they were able to access that through, um, through their accurate uh, face processing. So just really briefly um, to run through what the training consisted of, uh, it was presented on a computer. 
the sessions were an hour long and we trained for five to eight hours depending on how long it took the trainees to meet our criteria for expertise or until eight sessions were completed. And the training started, each session started with some rule-based instruction about how to look and attend to the face. And then there were the training, the matching activities that I described. And that was followed by a verification test. Oops. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so this study was, the initial study was conducted with adolescents and adults. Um, so these were older individuals. And it was part of an imaging study. So these were higher functioning or higher IQ individuals. Um, we then replicated uh, the study with adults alone. Um, same thing, um, part of an imaging study, so higher IQ adults. Um, the first study just included all comers. The second study um, required that the participants have an initial deficit in face processing. Okay. So uh, at the end of each session, they completed a verification task. And uh, this is what the data looks like. Um, the, the criteria for expertise in the literature were that someone would be as efficient or automatic at processing the subordinate level of classification. So in our case, the uh, gender of the face um, as they were at the, at the individual level of classification. So basic and individual level of classification would not be significantly different in terms of reaction time, which is how it was operationalized. In addition, we thought that you could get to that sort of um, identical level of reaction time and still be at chance in terms of your accuracy. So we wanted to make sure that that wasn't happening. And we required an 85% accuracy for the matching as well. So you can see the data from one individual subject here. Uh, on the, uh, the lighter blue line um, represents the, the basic level of classification, the gender level. And you can see that the reaction time is faster right at the beginning. Um, it's about um, half the reaction time of the individual level initially. And then over the course of the sessions, um, we see a reduction in individual level reaction time until there's no significant difference on those last two sessions. And we really um, wanted to see the um, two um, sessions in a row where there was no difference to make sure that that wasn't happening by chance. So all of our uh, trainees actually met this level of expertise that was defined in the literature, which in and of itself was exciting to us because um, we were taking individuals who, on average, we would expect to have impairments, maybe not be able to be expert. And um, we were seeing changes in adults. So we thought that both of those things were really promising. But um, it doesn't really matter if we don't see generalization to other faces and beyond the lab. So we also uh, conducted a couple of experiments before and after training. And in the first, um, this was a sort of a proof of concept with our smaller study that included adolescents and adults. Uh, we had a match to sample task where participants saw a target face and then either the target again or a distractor that differed based on the configural information in the face, so the distances between features. <clears throat> and what we found was that the groups differed in terms of their accuracy um, from pre to post training. So the group that received training had improvements, and the group that was on the wait list condition did not. And um, because it was such a small study, we only had five subjects in each group. We wanted to look at individual results as well, which is what I have graphed here. So on the left, we have uh, the participants who received the training, and we see that four out of five of them had an improvement. And on the right, we see the five participants who were in the waitlist condition. Um, only one had a very small improvement, and some of them actually even got worse. So we think that the task um, may have been confusing, as you saw the faces uh, repeated at the post-testing session and the training actually helped you sort out that information. Uh, in a follow-up study, we compared face training to a, a comparison group of individuals with autism who received house expertise training. We wanted to control for the experience of coming into the lab and um, sitting with a trainer and, and doing these training activities. And we also were kind of curious whether um, house training would have similar effects or if it really was the faces that mattered. <clears throat> 
So uh, what we found for this study was that uh, we had an increased inversion effect for the group that received face training. So uh, on the left, we see the group that was trained on faces, and we see that they had an improvement from pre to post on the upright condition, whereas the inverted condition actually um, decreased. So the inversion effect is getting stronger because you're looking at the, the contrast between upright and inverted. And the house training group actually had the opposite effect. <clears throat> Uh, we also looked at reaction time to upright faces. So for correct reaction time, the uh, group that received face training uh, was faster after training. So their uh, processing became more efficient. So we also wanted to know uh, if this had any sort of clinical significance. And we wanted to see whether the training generalized beyond the lab. Uh, the easiest way that we could think of to do this was to have a research assistant unknown to the participants interrupt our session at post-testing. Uh, they briefly came into the room, said, excuse me, um, after a few seconds, left. And then about a half an hour later, we pulled out a card that looked like this, and we asked the participant to identify the person who had intruded on the session. And the, the participants who received face training were more likely to identify the intruder or the person that was rated as the most similar distractor uh, compared to the house training group, which was more at chance on this task. And then finally, we were interested in brain activation. So we wanted to examine some of the ERP components that are thought to be related to face processing and early visual attention. And uh, we looked before and after training at upright, inverted, upright and inverted faces and houses. And we saw that for the group that received face training, there was a reduction in amplitude at the P1 component, which is thought to be related to visual attention to a stimulus. Um, so that the individuals with autism, um, we interpreted that as being more efficient in um, their initial sensory processing of the face information after training. About the same time uh, at the University of Washington, there is a clinical trial going on testing the Early Start Denver model. And we thought we really should be thinking about face processing in this more comprehensive intervention as well, and thinking about the things that we've learned from a targeted intervention and how we might be able to insert a targeted module about faces into this more comprehensive intervention. So uh, I'm going to jump. Um, and just show you a quick video clip if I can, um, just to give you a sense of what the Early Start Denver model session looks like. And this is, um, this is Sally Rogers. There's no sound. Um, this is an empirically promising uh, comprehensive intervention for toddlers. So this randomized trial was for 18 to 30 month olds. And um, as you can see here, uh, Dr. Rogers is uh, really um, meeting the child where he's at and engaging with him. Um, her face is um, positioned in a way so that he can see her clearly. Um, she's, you know, really imitating and, and um, interacting with him in a very reciprocal way so that um, she's matching his emotion. And right now they're working on the sensory social routine, so she's picking something that's motivating for him. And... Uh, um, and then trying to um, extend his skills by scaffolding what, what he's doing. So they're working on some speech sounds and some communication sounds. As part of this, we took the training concept of matching uh, meaningful information and oops, here we go. Um, looking at different angles of faces. And um, we wanted to make this a more naturalistic downward extension of what we've been doing with the adults. So um, instead of presenting activities on a computer, because these were toddlers, we made individualized flip books, um, photo albums for each child. And in the flip books, uh, there were pictures of known faces, so parents, uh, therapists, siblings, if there were uh, siblings. And the children um, learned to match um, or identify the familiar face over a number of trials. And um, we're also um, uh, gave them practice um, identifying those faces with different um, manipulations. So you can see some of the manipulations um, down at the lower right um, where they had to um, use just sort of limited information about the face. So uh, looking at that study, um, in addition to the behavioral findings, um, some follow-up work looked at event-related potentials. And uh, we looked at um, the uh, 
P1, um, N170, and NC component. And um, this was in response to faces and toys. And we found that there were differences um, between the group that received the Early Start Denver model plus our um, face module um, in comparison to a group that received community intervention on the NC component. So um, this would um, be a marker of um, engagement um, and attention to a stimulus. And we saw um, that the group with the Early Start Denver model actually didn't differ from a typically developing comparison group. Um, so this is after training only. Um, we have no way of knowing the specific impact of the face training module within this, but um, I think the combination of the kinds of intensive interactions that happened more naturalistically, as I showed you, and the face training um, combined together to, to, um, to result in these kinds of um, brain improvements. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Is there, why is the show is up there real up there? Any theory about that? Because it was different from, I remember, Dawson's earlier study, right? Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so the, um, you can go back and look. So there were um, a couple of different components. So Dawson's earlier work would be um, more, pos most, more posterior, mm -hmm. um, and that would be um, more like N170, um, P1. And so we were interested because we thought um, potentially that attention um, to faces may be um, another type of outcome, just um, uh, more of a shift to attention that we were also looking at the NC. Okay. So um, just to kind of recap um, the face training, um, we saw more expert behavior towards faces um, in adults. And um, in particular, we saw um, changes both in brain and neural responses to faces, um, particularly in components related to attention. Um, so this was across adults and children. And um, we were particularly excited, again, by these changes in older individuals. So um, it was nice to see that, um, that it's not too late, that there's an opportunity for change um, even in older individuals. And um, we also were excited to just see that um, some of these more targeted interventions can be incorporated more broadly into comprehensive interventions. So now I'm going to shift gears, and during the second part of my talk, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the work that's going on now and that I've been doing um, more recently. Um, so this uh, has to do with executive function and executive function training. And uh, just to kind of make sure we're on the same page, since executive function can be kind of a slippery concept, uh, I'm going to be talking to you about a set of interrelated, high-order, uh, self-regulatory and cognitive processes that are related to goal-directed controlled thought and behavior. So let me um, give you some examples. So um, here we have a problem. I'm thinking about the problem-solving model. We have a goal or a problem that needs to be solved. Um, in this case, it may be a novel problem, so building something that's never been built before with blocks. And it's a complex problem. Um, it may be something that um, can't, can't be accomplished with an automatic task, like just simply stacking blocks. And so these are the kinds of situations where executive function is really going to come into play. And in order to solve that problem, a young child would have to first form a plan, um, so generate some different ideas of how that problem might be solved. And then as the plan is being executed, monitor how it's going, um, whether the plan is being executed effectively. And then um, upon evaluation, maybe shift strategy or inhibit strategies that aren't working. Um, so for example, um, you know, uh, and holding information in mind. So holding information about um, you know, mom's preferences for water in your moat and inhibiting your desire to have water in that moat. Um, all of these things would go into executive function. And, and we can see these in a variety of different kinds of real world situations. Um, in the lab, those are typically thought of as um, being related to inhibition, shifting of attention, working memory. Um, they're related to prefrontal function. And in particular, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the distinction between tasks that look at conflicting information versus delaying a response. So first I'll share with you um, a pretty classic task that looks at goal-directed behavior and delaying a response. So this is the classic marshmallow task or delay of gratification task. In this task, the child is presented with a dilemma. So a child can either have one treat immediately or two treats after an unspecified amount of time. 
And if the child prefers to stop waiting and get the um, single treat, then there's a bell available to summon an examiner back into the room. Uh, the examiner explains the rules, leaves the room, and then the child is left to wait and potentially ring the bell. So I'm going to show you an example of a child who uh, actually had some pretty effective strategies. And this little boy is doing a couple of things that would potentially be helpful. Uh, so first of all, he's taking the reward aspect out of the task by coming up with um, a more cognitive strategy where he's rehearsing the rules. And he's also um, shifted his eyes away from the treats, um, which is also potentially helpful. If you sit and um, study the temptation, um, it may make it harder to avoid the temptation. Um, so on this task, um, this is the first time um, that this task was administered to children with autism. And this sample was a group of six and seven year olds on the autism spectrum, and they were um, matched on age and IQ um, to the comparison group. So um, for these children, um, about 60% of the kids with autism were able to wait for the entire 15 minute delay, which is the appropriate delay for children this age, whereas about 90% of the typically developing kids were able to do that. Um, while the um, children were participating in our study, we asked parents to complete a set of packets, and one of the questionnaires that they completed was the um, Rothbart uh, Child Behavior Questionnaire. And on this questionnaire, there's a domain called Effortful Control, which looks at some of the same things that uh, Delay of Gratification looks at. And what we found is that parents of kids with autism were reporting um, lower levels of effortful control, particularly due to two uh, subskills, um, one related to attention focusing and one related to inhibitory control, and the individual differences on effortful control mattered. So the children who had lower effortful control within the autism group were more likely to have more uh, severe symptoms as rated by a clinician on the diagnostic measure that we did. So that's a measure of delay. Now I'm going to talk to you about some measures of conflict. So um, measuring conflicting information processing, uh, we used a task with the same sample. Uh, this task was a dimensional change card sort, which is a child version of the adult Wisconsin card sort. So initially children are presented with two kinds of cards, these two up on the top, and they sort either by color or shape, and then they have to shift and sort by the opposite rule, and it's counterbalanced. Uh, then after a while, um, they switch to another phase where they see some cards with stars and some cards without. Uh, the star would indicate one rule and the absence of a star would indicate that they would sort by the other rule. So they're actually going back and forth between these two rules. <clears throat> so we found again that children with autism had more difficulty on this task. Uh, individual differences were related to IQ, but above and beyond IQ, uh, performance on this task for kids with autism related to social communication function. So again, um, just tying these uh, executive function behaviors back to the social symptoms that we see I think is important. Uh, another way to do that is to look longitudinally. So um, here we um, had a different sample, again, of um, young children. Um, this was children who were verbal but not, um, not necessarily um, average IQ. And these children were verbal at age three to four when they were initially tested. They were given a battery of play and executive function activities. And um, we looked at whether executive function might predict play uh, a couple of years later when children were age six and they came back into the lab. And uh, initial IQ, age, and initial play skills predicted play outcomes. But above and beyond that, executive function at the first time point predicted later play skills as well. Um, so these executive function skills really are important in terms of the development of kids on the spectrum. Um, we also looked at whether the reverse was true, whether executive function, uh, sorry, whether, rather whether play predicted executive function, and that was not the case. So executive function does seem to be um, specifically important. Uh, so one thing that's been kind of interesting looking at the developmental cognitive neuroscience literature is uh, looking at the emergence of training for executive function. Um, we've really done, a, I think, a pretty thorough job of documenting the deficits that we see in executive function in individuals with autism. And um, these new trainings that are um, becoming available give us an idea of, of a way that we might be able to uh, enhance or train the skills of kids with autism. So um, 
again, these trainings sort of fall into the same categories that behavioral intervention does for autism. Um, you could target just one specific domain, such as inhibition, or you could take a more comprehensive approach, um, for example, um, designing a classroom where there's a particular instructional style that's going to foster the development of executive function. Uh, we can um, do training with typically developing kids, and we see um, benefits on tasks, particularly tasks that measure conflict processing. And we see as well that these tasks generalize to other domains like visual processing and um, behavioral regulation. So one of the more uh, targeted uh, training interventions uh, was developed by Charo Rueda and her colleagues. And uh, she designed a, a set of games that is implemented over five hours. Um, it was originally designed for preschoolers, although now she's um, extended it upward to higher age ranges. And um, the types of tasks would be um, things like a go-no-go -no -go task, where um, children have to decide whether to let sheep into a barn. And then every once in a while, there's a wolf in sheep's clothing. And you have to prevent that wolf from getting into the barn. So just simple, kid-friendly tasks that are going to um, enhance things like inhibition. Uh, among typically developing preschoolers, uh, these kinds of tasks um, produce gains on visual problem solving. Um, we see changes in ERP responses, um, in N2 amplitude and scalp distribution, and then a longer follow-up training study that uh, delivered 10 hours of a similar type of training um, produced effects that were maintained for two months and um, had similar effects on the N2 component. So um, just to sort of recap what I've shown you so far, um, why should we train executive function in children with autism? Well. Um, kids with autism have uh, difficulty with executive function, even in the absence of cognitive impairment. Um, we see that uh, these difficulties are also very well documented, and um, as I've shown you, likely contribute to more broad symptoms and social function. Um, in typically developing kids, we also see that executive function is important for things like academic performance, um, long-term positive, um, outcomes such as job um, placement or later development of executive function. And we have these trainings that are available. So with all that being said, um, there are only two published training uh, papers looking at training of executive function in children with autism that I'm aware of. And so we would like to become a third. <laughs> um, we can train executive function by using tasks similar to the ones that Rueda has used and we're working with her now. Um, so the kinds of training activities that we'll be doing are appropriate for 7 to 11 year olds with autism and we're just completing our piloting to fine tune this. And we're interested in measuring change using conflict tasks. Um, we're interested in using the computer to measure these behavioral changes so that we can remove the social aspect of um, sitting face to face with a clinician and doing tabletop testing. And we're measuring the effects of training or planning to at multiple levels. So we're interested in um, more direct effects of training on the kinds of behaviors that we would expect, um, cognitive performance on tasks that measure conflict. Uh, so we've conducted an initial study where we've looked at a group of um, typically developing 7 to 11 year olds in comparison to an age and IQ matched group with autism. And we found that these tasks are sensitive to the kind of differences that we're looking for, that groups differed on all four of the tasks in our battery. I'll be talking to you about just one tonight. And then um, we also had a set of comparison tasks that looked more at delay. And we um, found that um, in this age range and with these tasks, um, our children didn't differ. Um, we're also collecting parent and teacher report just to get a sense of whether these effects might generalize to home in the classroom. And um, here's the task um, that we've been using to look at both brain and behavior. So this is the child attention network task, which is a flanker task. Um, in this task, children have a brief cue. Um, so they would see a crosshair and hear a beep. And then um, they would see either a congruent or incongruent stimulus. And the child has to decide which direction the central target is swimming and it's flanked by either congruent or incongru incongruent flankers. So this task requires inhibition of that conflicting flanker information. Um, what we found so far is that children with autism were less accurate overall. Both groups were less accurate on the incongruent condition, which is what we'd expect, so our manipulation is working. 
Um, the children with autism tended to be relatively worse on the incongruent condition, so they're um, having more difficulty inhibiting that conflicting information. And they're also slower across the board. Uh, interestingly, the children with autism who were most disrupted by the incongruent trials um, had more severe clinician-observed social symptoms and more severe history of parent-reported communication difficulties. Uh, we also looked at ERP responses to uh, of the children in this um, task, and so we looked at a couple of components. The P1, which again looks at visual attention, um, conflict monitoring um, at the N2, and stimulus evaluation at the P3. And we predicted that um, children with autism would have larger amplitudes to these um, conditions, um, as particularly the incongruent condition, um, which would represent less efficient monitoring. So um, at the P1, we found that there is a group by condition interaction. So the typically developing group um, had an effect of congruent versus incongruent, um, whereas the children with autism um, process those more similarly. And within the typically developing group, um, the P1 amplitude, um, children who had greater differences had larger disruptions in their behavioral performance as well between the congruent and incongruent condition. Um, so brain and behavior were um, hanging together more in the typically developing group. Um, for the N2 component, um, and I'm just, uh, I forgot to mention, but um, the windows that we looked at for these components um, are sort of highlighted by those gray boxes, um, and we're looking at mean amplitude. Um, for this condition, we found that the children with autism had a greater amplitude across conditions. Um, so again, less efficient processing, um, less efficient monitoring of that conflicting information across the two conditions. Um, within the typically developing group, we saw that brain and behavior, again, corresponded so that um, children who had the larger difference between congruent and incongruent at the N2 in the typically developing group um, had more difficulty with executive function overall, um, metacognition, and behavioral regula regulation by parent report. And then finally, for the P3, we didn't find any differences um, between groups or between conditions. However, um, within the typically developing group, again, there is a correspondence between brain and behavior at the individual level. Um, and it was similar to what we saw at the end, too. So children who had um, more difference in terms of their processing of the incongruent versus congruent um, had more difficulty with executive function. So this gives us some clear targets for our treatment study, which we're embarking on um, <laughs> any day. <laughs> um, we are interested in looking at those behavioral tasks to see whether we can reduce the disruption to conflicting information. Um, we're also interested in whether we see changes in amplitude for the N2 component in particular, um, and also scalp distribution, which is one of the findings that Rueda reported, so um, more efficient, um, more um, focused scalp distribution. Um, and because we didn't see the kind of correlations um, in the group with autism between brain and behavior, we thought that this is actually a potentially interesting treatment outcome as well. Um, so it's possible that uh, children with autism may be using some sort of compensatory strategy currently, and to the extent that um, we're able to train and improve those systems, we might see more of a correspondence to what the brain is doing and, and how that maps to behavior. Uh, and then, of course, we're interested in generalization. We're also really interested in how, of course, how these pieces of executive function might relate to social function. And so we have a battery of social cognition measures. We're able to look at individual differences in the large combined sample at baseline. So we'll have children who are randomized to either training or a wait list condition. And we'll be able to combine those groups and look at um, how both brain and behavior uh, to executive function tasks relates to social cognition. And then we'll actually be able to see if we are able to improve executive function, whether we also see corresponding improvements in social behavior. So we'll measure that uh, behaviorally in the lab as well as uh, through parent and teacher report. So just to recap, uh, we've um, looked at both delay and conflict executive tasks, and we see disruptions in young children with autism, even in the absence of general IQ impairment. And we've also looked at um, whether these um, behaviors are related to social symptoms and found that individual differences in executive function do correspond to social symptoms, um, both for conflict and delay tasks. 
Uh, we've focused on conflict tasks because um, those tasks seem to be more linked to the kinds of training outcomes that we see from um, these targeted executive function trainings. And um, these kinds of things can be enhanced in typically developing children. And so we're really interested in whether we can do that in kids with autism. And I think we have some, some nice behavioral and neural markers that we can look for. So just broadly um, stepping back and thinking about these kinds of targeted interventions, um, I think that there's, as I've said at the beginning, a real public health need for improving intervention, becoming more sophisticated um, with more individualized interventions. So um, finding um, which domains particular individuals on the spectrum um, are struggling with, and then targeting those interventions or coming up with a more modul modular approach. Um, that might be one way of, of helping um, both to improve um, how we're delivering treatment in general, and also um, it will help us um, take a more mechanistic approach to understanding what treatment is doing. Uh, we also, through these targeted interventions, um, can look um, in a scientifically rigorous way uh, at how um, manipulations of these systems impact uh, change on the neural and behavioral responses that we're seeing, so we can see what changes and what doesn't, and what sort of things change together. Um, the work that we've done so far with face recognition and executive function can provide a model for these kinds of testing, um, for neural response, um, for looking at generalization beyond the lab, and um, can show us that these kinds of targeted interventions can be useful for older individuals. And um, through the um, kind of example that I showed you with the Early Start Denver model, I think these uh, targeted interventions um, don't need to be standalone, but could be, again, combined with more comprehensive intervention. So I just wanted to thank the research team, um, my funding sources, and um, an amazing group of collaborators. And um, I wanted to do a little shameless pitch for our study, which is just starting. So um, we're looking for seven to 11-year-olds who might be interested in um, having executive function training and playing our games. Thank you so much. <laughs>
these kinds of studies have really pushed my thinking in terms of what we, um, what we do and what we take um, and how we can apply that back into the clinic. So, uh, you know, I don't think we're, um, we're anywhere close to being ready to using these kinds of measures, um, these neural measures clinically. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, this is, hopefully, um, you know, you'll agree that th this kind of work needs to be done in order to move that forward and, um, and with larger numbers of individuals so we can really kind of tease apart and, and come up with more standardized, um, quantifiable Isolating measurements. Isolating behavioral variables is just tortuous, but mm -hmm. it's also a <coughs> adventure in the jungle trying to isolate mm -hmm. those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, you know, we thought, I think very naively at the beginning of our face training work that um, it was a very simple sort of contained domain that would be straightforward to, to measure and study. And I think even though that's a subdomain, um, face recognition is sort of a subdomain within face processing, which is a subdomain within your social processing, um, you know, even within that there's a lot of variability with the, uh, the adults that we study. Maybe I missed uh, a tutorial, but uh, the the face recognition training does it also improve the overall IQ in the you know audition uh, children? Like, does it have a overall effect also you know uh, on the you know IQ or like general? So um, neither. Um, well, so the face training. Um, we didn't look at that, but the participants in our study already had average or above average IQ. Um, so that, um, that wasn't something that we were interested in targeting. Um, I've actually been thinking a lot about um, lately about whether we need to add that um, with the executive function training because um, in the typically developing samples that receive training and, and show more enhanced executive function, um, it does seem to generalize to um, visual processing, visual IQ our performance IQ. Um, so that could potentially um, have some effect. Um, again, we're looking at children who have average or above average IQ. Um, it doesn't mean that they couldn't get even better, but um, I think you know, that's an interesting question. So um, the issue with um, executive function and sort of theory of mind or intuitive psychology is, is not clear, right? So Zalazo argues that late threes, early fours, this, this you know, if-then rule system kicks in. Mm -hmm. And so you see um, pat, kids pass a simpler version of the card sort, mm -hmm. and also false belief tests mm -hmm. and the like. Um, but it's clear that kids are pretty socially savvy before that. Mm -hmm. And language, right? Um, whatever we think of you know, the false belief measure. Mm -hmm. So, um, Alan Leslie, for instance, argues that the competence is there. Um, it's been there for years, and what executive function does is allows uh, performance factors, right? Allows them to pass these uh, mm -hmm. tasks. Um, mm -hmm. So, I see why you're with the computer and why you're like, EF is definitely going to be important for these kids. Mm -hmm. But you would think that you would want to start sooner and sort of question is, do you think EF is a core problem? For autism? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I think it's hard to know on some level because I think it's hard to, um, so if it, if it were a core problem, we should see it very early on. Right, so the question is, really, we don't know when executive function develops. Yeah. Um, so um, from my work, I'm not sure that it matters, um, and that's why I think I, you know, I've tried to go um, in each study to look and sort of tie it back to those individual differences in social function. Um, you know, I'm not sure, um, you know, I'm not sure that all individuals with um, autism have executive function impairments. Um, the, the number I showed you just kind of ballpark and we're finding similar num numbers if you look at just sort of pass-fail criteria on those tasks, um, that it's about half or two-thirds of the kids on any particular task, but if you gave a whole battery, um, would there be some difficulty on at least one of them? Um, so I'm not sure you know, if it's gonna meet the criteria for a core impairment where it's universal, it's there at the beginning, um, but I do think it matters. Um, I think it matters in terms of the social um, function and symptoms that we see, I think it's a contributor. 
And um, I think it potentially matters in terms of predicting treatment response um, in general. So in my clinical work, uh, looking at um, working with individuals um, in a treatment setting, um, I think you know executive function difficulties can really get in the way of children benefiting from intervention. Um, so I think, it, and I think it in general. I mean, this is why parents are coming into clinic a lot of times um, for older, higher functioning kids. You know, the executive function is is one area that's really impaired that's affecting the ability to perform in school and, and later in life probably in um, a, a professional or um, job setting. So. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think it's hard to answer whether it's a core impairment. I don't, it, I think it may not be. It may be for a large number of the kids, um, thinking about different kinds of autism, but, um, but I, I still think it's worth trying to intervene with and, and measuring. Uh, you probably know, after the disappointment with the fragile trials, one of the things that have been discussed is integrating some type of behavioral cognitive training with drug mm -hmm. you know, intervention. So what you have presented works obviously very well with average IQ kids. And how do you see these type of interventions uh, being adapted to deal with lower cognitive function, and particularly to this new model of intervention combining Mm -hmm. training or training and, and, and drug intervention. Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, for, for lower functioning individuals, you can imagine that um, the kind of work that we did with toddlers where it's a simplified version of the face training um, you know, might be appropriate for older, lower functioning, lower IQ individuals. Um, the um, work with executive function, I think, is also scalable. Um, so. Um, you know, it's appropriate for typically developing preschoolers. Um, I think, you know, you could potentially think about how you could um, deliver that to even younger kids um, by simplifying the tasks even more um, in the same way that you would downward extend some of the measurement tasks that we use for executive function down to toddlers, for example. Um, in terms of combining um, with, uh, you know, pharmaceutical, psychopharmacological in intervention, um, I think it's, um, in some ways nice because um, you can sort of isolate what you're doing behaviorally. Um, so um, to the extent that you know, you're combining it, you, you can at least know where you're looking then to see um, you know, the effects of, of the intervention that we're doing. That's all. Uh, thanks, Susan, again.